Um, this is the second and final day of the Michigan Supreme Court's December case call. We have five cases to hear this morning. Um, the first one is People versus Kevin White. This is a 15 minute mini oral argument on the application. Uh, Mr. Gentry, you can try and reserve some of your 15 minutes for rebuttal, but we, we like you to try and keep track of that yourself. And if you are ready to go, you may proceed. Well, thank you, Your Honors. I would like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal. I will keep track of my time. As required by McBurroughs, the defendant here filed the interlocutory application and the appropriate remedy if venue is um, improper is dismissal. This court's first question asks whether the principle can be attributed, the acts of the principle can be attributed to the aider and the better and the, for purposes of venue. And the answer is a qualified yes, Your Honors. Um, if the acts could otherwise be attributed. While the prosecution talks a lot about his theory of the case, the, there needs to be some tie of the facts to the acts of the aider and a better and the principal. This court in Robinson addressed the level that must be shown. Um, and here it's a probable cause. At trial, it will be at a reasonable doubt to make the aider and a better liable for the principal's actions. There are three ways under Robinson, intent, knowledge, and natural and probable consequences. Here, as this court has already held, intent and knowledge are out because there's no indication, just like in McBurroughs, that the defendant even knew the decedent existed, uh, quoting from McBurroughs. That leaves natural and probable consequences, which brings us to the court's second question. Here, the record has nothing to address the defendant's knowledge. I'm going to talk about the prosecution's non-record information in a moment. Um, all the prosecution can offer is Plunkett's stream of commerce test, but that's not a test for venue at all. That's how this court explained who can be charged under MCL 750.317A, not where they can be charged. If the prosecution is correct on stream of commerce, then someone who delivers in Detroit could be charged seven handoffs later for a death in Marquette, even though they had no awareness or intent that the drugs would make it to the UP. Stream of commerce is a test for who can be charged. It's no test at all for where a person can be charged. As to the prosecution's offer here, um, still not presented in a motion to expand the record. The transcript of prosecution offered from the other case, Ms. Hannaford's, is September 25th, 2020. This application was filed after that on October 18th, 2020. And the prosecution answered this application on January 8th, 2021. Only after this court ordered a mini oral argument did the prosecution come with forth with this transcript on reconsideration. That's not only disrespectful of this court's deliberative process and the time spent at conference, it's an appellate parachute. And under Pollock and Hardin, those things don't work for the defense and they shouldn't work for the prosecution either in this case. And with that, I'm happy to address any questions the court might have. Thank you, Mr. Gentry. I am gonna start with Justice Zara. Um, thank you. Um, I, understand, I understand what you're saying, but, but I'm having a hard time uh, getting past uh, the notion that the Court of Appeals got this right when it um, Claim that any deficiencies in the prosecutor's aiding and abetting argument should be made in a motion to quash the bind over, not a motion to dismiss for lack of venue. And I'm particularly moved by the actual language of the aiding and abetting statute, which, you know, which says that it's proper for the principal. Um, let me see. The aider and abetter can be, quote, prosecuted, indicted, and tried as if he had directly committed such offense. I mean, that language there seems to suggest to me that, that venue would be okay, that, that your real remedy is to, to quash the bind over. What, what's your response to that? My response to that, Your Honor, is that in McBurroughs, this court approved a motion to, change, to quash the venue, and therefore it seems as though the appropriate response is to focus on the venue. Certainly, we could go back if this court directs and move to quash the bind over on the deficiency in this area. And quite frankly, I think that's probably what's going to happen anyway, given the prosecution's non-record evidence. But I think this court should stick with McBurroughs and allow venue to be attacked based upon whether or not there was probable cause shown at the, um, at the bind over. Are there any cases applying the aiding and abetting theory to the venue statute in the way that you would have us do it? There's no, there's no cases applying the aiding and abetting theory to the venue statute at all that I could find. I locked on to Robinson simply because this court has said that that's what has to be shown to show an aider and a better is responsible for the principal's action. And it logically follows that if that level of intent is required for the underlying facts, that level of intent is required for the underlying facts in the particular venue. Um, there needs to be something here other than stream of commerce because stream of commerce, as I mentioned, um, that's all the way to the Afghan um, 
opiate farmer and his mule driver. Everybody is involved in the stream of commerce. It, that, that's not a venue test. That is, that is something that allows us to go way beyond what McBurrow said. And even when we have a defendant who wasn't aware that the scene existed, then that would allow us to bring them into a particular venue they had no idea. Mr. Um, White first knew of Livingston County when he arrived in the jail van. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honor. Justice Viviano? No questions. Justice Bernstein? Good morning, no questions. Justice Clement? No questions, thank you. Justice Kavanaugh? No questions for me. Justice Welch? No questions for me either. Um, Mr. Gentry, I, I, I share Justice Zara's um, puzzlement with why this is a venue challenge instead of a motion to dismiss of some kind, a motion to quash or some other kind of motion to dismiss. It seems like all of the authority I can locate in every other state and in all of the federal jurisdictions allows um, venue to be proper if the acts of the principal were committed in that county. Um, I don't know, I, I'm not sure why um, McBurroughs, which obviously doesn't have that wrinkle, is what is what you think um, we should be focusing on. I'm trying to understand your honor's question. If I get it right, you're saying this matter should go back and we should file a motion to quash the bind over. If that's what <laughs> if that's what the court does. I mean, if if that if the court decides McBurroughs is inapplicable, then the bind over approach would be the, the proper approach. You're saying that we should have filed a motion for bind over uh, to quash the bind over instead of a motion on venue. I'm just trying to understand why why I venue is what we're talking about when it seems like you're focused on the idea that there isn't any evidence um, that tends to support the idea that your client aided and abetted the principal. Um, I bet the prosecutor has a different take on that, but but I but I understand that's your your point of view. Is that is that right? That's correct, John. Okay. All right. Um, well, you may continue. You have another eight minutes, or you may reserve some. Time. I'll reserve, Your Honor. Okay. All right, Mr. Warden. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, William Warden, Assistant Prosecuting Attorney on behalf of the people. We ask this court to deny leave to appeal for two reasons. First, the aider and abetter can be charged wherever the principal is charged. And second, new facts, which undercut the defendant's claim of lack of knowledge and will be introduced at trial. For aiding and abetting, defendant need neither intend nor have knowledge of where the principal's act will occur. I supply the gun and pay someone to have someone else murdered. The person I hire follows the victim to another county and kills them there. Under our aiding and abetting theory and the rule under the similar federal aiding and abetting statute, venue is proper either where the gun was supplied or the murder occurred. Not true under the venue statute, unless I intended my act of supplying the gun to have an effect in the other county by the murder. An aider can be tried where his acts occurred or where those of the principal occurred, and there is no needed knowledge or intent as to effective acts somewhere else. Sometimes you can show venue under both theories, aiding and abetting and the venue statute, as in this case. The point of venue is to put the case where it makes sense to have the trial. We meet the venue statute because the crime of the principal occurred in Livingston, and under the aiding and abetting statute, that person may be charged just as the principal, which includes the place where the principal may be charged. The co-defendant has pled uh, to the act that made her the principal, and she will testify at defendant's trial. This court has not yet taken this case. This court can just deny leave, and that is what we are asking this court to do. Thank you, Mr. Worden. Um, Justice Zara. No questions, thank you. Justice Viviano. Uh, no questions. Justice Bernstein. Hey, counsel, good morning and welcome. Do good morning. You, well, uh, uh, thank you for joining us here today. Do you feel that there should ever be a limit to uh, the question that's in play in terms of where a person can be charged? Well, I, I think, you know, using the formula of crime committed under the, the McBurrow standard, the crime that we are prosecuting in Livingston County is the delivery from the principal to the decedent. And the uh, defendant is the aider and abetter. So under this particular theory, um, we meet the McBurrow's test of crime committed 
And we also meet the test of the aiding and abetting statute. And when we can put in our additional facts, we'll meet the test of the exception to the general venue rule as well. Thank you, counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. Justice Clement. Uh, no questions. Justice Kavanaugh. Uh, just what I wanted to clarify, you agree that those other facts are not part of this record, right? They've never been moved in another court to yes, actually Your Honor. consider them. I, I, so do, agree, I do agree with that, and, and, I, and I don't even think the court needs to consider those in order to deny leave because we do meet the aiding and abetting test for venue in this case. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Justice Welch. I have no questions, thank you. Uh, you have a lot of time left, counsel. You may continue if you have more to tell us. No, Your Honor. Uh, just to reiterate, we would ask this court to deny leave. Um, I, I do think, though, that um, Amicus uh, submitted a proposed court rule uh, regarding venue and when it should be raised. And I, I think, um, you know, a lot of time and effort uh, by the courts and by Mr. Gentry and myself have gone into this matter. And if the court, if the court does wish to do something regarding the venue issue and let prosecutors throughout the state of Michigan know what they can charge and when they can charge it, then perhaps, and, and also give defendants uh, uh, maybe a bright line rule on when to raise the issue, uh, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Uh, Mr. Gentry, you have some time left for any rebuttal. Just one point, Your Honor, on um, the hiring the hit man and the gun. That's a natural and probable consequence. That is always tieable to the aider and the better. Of, cor of course, regardless of what county the assassination would take place in, then you would be proper because it's a natural and probable consequence when you hand a gun and hire somebody to kill someone that they're going to kill them. That's a very different thing than a multiple downstream transaction. And the prosecution's effort here would allow no end of multiple downstream transactions. Someone five or six handoffs upstream could be charged for a downstream transaction in a county they're totally unaware of. And that's, that goes beyond where this court went in the burrows. Isn't it possible that it's the natural and probable consequence of any drug sale that the buyer might share it with others? And if the drugs are laced with fentanyl, others might also die? I think that is a natural and probable consequence, but we have to talk about a natural prob probable consequence where, or there is no venue rule anymore. The legislature put a venue rule in to exist somewhere. There, there has to be, as this court talked about in McBurrows, there is a general venue rule and exceptions. This exception has no end if, that's, if, if we say that a natural probable consequence is anywhere downstream, someone might die, then that exception has no end. There's no longer general venue rule. Thank you. Are there any additional questions for Mr. Gentry? Okay, seeing none, thank you both. The case will be submitted. Thank, thank you, you, Your Honor.